Okay, so originally I actually copied a piece from the Nesiva Shalom the Slonim Rebbe on Pesach, where the Slonim Rebbe develops the idea that, it's not his idea, it's, it's since Pesach happened, it's been the idea. Pesach is the Chag Emuna. So this is our Emuna class, this is our Emuna WhatsApp, uh, our, Emuna, our Emuna support group, where we get together to remind ourselves that whatever stress, whatever challenges come our way in life, to take that deep breath, Ein od mil vado, that everything is from Hashem, it's by design, it's for a reason, and therefore we can relieve any sense of anxiety, anger, envy, or the emotions that sabotage our own happiness. So that all derives, it all stems from Pesach. Pesach is the Chag Ha'emunah. And the whole exercise, the purpose of the Seder night, is to increase and to promote our sense of emuna. We are on a journey from, as the, as the Seder is structured, as the Haggadah itself is structured, the Maschel Begenos and Messiah and Beshvach, we start out, with Diginus, we start out with something which is degrading, something which is negative about ourselves. A whole lesson in its own right we've spoken a lot about in the past, that we need to be willing to expose our children, our family, our friends to our imperfections. We don't flaunt them, we don't embrace them, we don't show them off, but when we try to promote as if we are perfect and we live in a perfect world, then things will implode, people will collapse, relationships will fail, no one and nothing is perfect, and we're not afraid to share our uh, pimples and warts, figuratively, at the Seder. Um, and we start, Mascha Beginus. And of course, the famous Machlok is Rav and Shmuel. What does it mean that we start out with something disparaging? So one opinion is, We mentioned that, you know what? We weren't always this righteous. We weren't always this faithful. We weren't always this virtuous. Our ancestors, our forefathers, were Ovdei Avodazar. They were idolaters. They got it wrong. They were living incorrect religious lives. And we're not afraid to tell you that. But look how far we've come and look who we are now and look where yet we can go. That's one opinion. The other opinion is Avadim Hayinu, that we were slaves. And of course, this machlokis, this debate is which is the emphasis of the, which is the focus of the Seder? Is it physical freedom and emancipation? Is it a journey from being physically enslaved to physical freedom? Or is the emphasis of the Seder night a more metaphysical, emotional, spiritual journey from slavery to freedom? The answer, of course, is both, but the machlok is, the debate is, which is the emphasis of the Seder? What are we trying to recall? That we were physically in bondage, and look at us now, we're physically free? Or that we were emotionally, spiritually in bondage, and look now how emotionally free that we are? We'll talk about it more the Shabbos, Shabbos HaGadol. Our topic is about the Seder night is a model for living with Seder all year round, and the notion of what it means to be Pinei Chorin, because really it's a contradiction. We left, God, God freed us, He liberated us, we're no longer slaves to Paro, instead we became slaves to Him. What kind of freedom is that? So the answer is that you can only achieve freedom through discipline. And the reason that we celebrate freedom with Seder is to motivate us to live our entire lives with Seder. To be punctual, to be on time, to be organized, to have rules, to have regulations, and only in a framework can we actually achieve real, a real sense of freedom. So slavery is when you procrastinate and you're lazy, when you're a mess and you're uncoordinated and disorganized, when you can't get your act together, you're enslaved to those qualities that you can't get past. And when you have discipline and you're, you're, you're reigning over your own life, then that actually creates freedom. That actually creates freedom, just as an example. If you want financial freedom, then you need financial discipline. If you have no financial discipline and you rack up credit card debt and you spend beyond your means, that doesn't give you freedom that you're undisciplined in your spending. That enslaves you. Now you're enslaved to credit cards, to debtors the rest of your life. For financial freedom, you need financial discipline. That's just an example. It's a metaphor for everything in life. You want freedom from technology, you need something called Shabbos. You need rules and regulations. Anyway, we're going to talk more about this, this, uh, this Shabbos. That's just a little preview. So the question is, is it a journey from a physical bondage to f- physical freedom or a spiritual, emotional, um, existential, supernatural, metaphysical bondage to all of that of, of freedom? Which is the emphasis? And the answer is that Pesach is the Chag The moment that we invest in Hashem, defer to Hashem, feel His presence in our life, we achieve both. It liberates us both physically and even metaphysically as well. It enables us to reach our, our highest levels. So there's a beautiful piece from the Slanam Rebbe, which I literally copied, and that's what we're going to learn, and then I shelved it. And instead, I want to learn this with you. Because the piece that we're going to learn together really, I think, is... You know, the notion of Pesach as a Chag Ha'amunah is important, and it bears repeating and review, and it's also incredibly cliched. We know it. Every Dvar Torah is about it. We, hit, we review it every year. I want to share with you something which is new. 
a sort of new angle on Pesach, maybe one that we wouldn't anticipate or expect, and bring a different attitude and approach to our Pesach this year. It comes from a sefer called Halakach Vahalibov. Halakach Vahalibov's author is, bless you, Rav Avram Shor, bless you, Rav Avram Shor. Rav Avram Shor is a Rav in uh, Brooklyn, New York. His father was Rav Gedalia Shor, that's all, the uh, author of the sefer Or Gedal Yahu. Rav Avram Shor is a Ger Chassid, an extraordinary Talmud Chacham. Recently on our base medrash of BRS fly into New York, we went with a whole group of men. We visited 12 different rabbis around the New York area to learn, to ask, to talk. So he was one of them. I'd never met him before, in the, deep in the basement under his shul in, in Brooklyn. And he's a, a very intense, intense, great Talmud Chacham. His eyes can burn a hole in the back of your head. Very intense, very passionate, very intense. Just being in his presence, talking to him, learning from him, listening to him is really impactful and transformative. So he has many svarim, they're called Halakach v'halibov, and his sefer on Pesach, he has the piece that's in front of you called Hazman l'hasagaz da'as kono, the time to embrace the das, the, the, the will of kono, of the one who owns us, of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, of the Almighty. Okay, see it? You got it? Isa b'gemar, the Gemara in Erevin says the following, Amar Rabbi Chanina, kol ha-mispateh b'yeno yeshbo mi da'as kono, shene'emar, v'yarech Hashem ezreach anichoach. The Gemara there says that a person who imbibes, indulges in wine has experienced yeshbo midas kono, has experienced being connected to Hashem. What does that mean? We're not endorsing alcohol, alcoholism. We believe in drinking responsibly and in moderation, of course. But what it means is that when you remove your inhibition, and you stop thinking that you are the source of everything, then you make room for another, you make room for Hashem. Ego, in the program, they say ego stands for edging God out. A person who has an ego has edged God out. There's not enough room in the universe, not enough room in the universe for both us and Hashem. So when we think that the world has to operate the way we need it to operate, what do you mean? This was supposed to be a green light. It was supposed to leave on time. The person was supposed to meet here then. This was supposed to happen this way. I wasn't supposed to get the flu. When we think that we're, the universe has to operate the way that we wrote it up, then our ego, and we've edged God out. God says, okay, you don't need me. You think you're in control. You're running the world. You've got everything planned. I'm out of here. You're on your own. And when you're on your own, you're exposed to the elements and to people and to things. But instead, when we shrink our ego, and instead of edging God out, we edge God in, we make room for Him, we recognize and we relinquish control to Him. doesn't mean we don't take initiative and do everything that we need to do, but we relinquish control to Him. When we make room for Hashem, then He fills that room. It says, the Pasuk says, that what's the goal? The mitzvah of the evening is to tell over the story. Sipur Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. That is the goal of the evening, to tell the story. And why are we telling the story? Here's what we're really telling the children is, sometimes you feel alone, abandoned. Sometimes you're not sure why things are happening the way they are. Sometimes you wish things were different. Sometimes you think you're the subject of randomness and chance. I want to tell you a story about your great bubbies and great zadies. I want to tell you a story about your ancestors and how we're here now. It's a 3,500-year-old story from Harsinai. I want to tell you a story when we were in Egypt and they felt down and out, 210 years of suffering and they felt invisible and neglected. And then Hashem came in and He orchestrated things and He suspended the rules of nature because He's intimately involved in our lives. And that's why He introduces the Aserah Sadibros, Anochi Hashem Lokecha, not I'm the Lord your God who created the world, but I'm the Lord your God who took you out of Egypt. And why are we going through this whole exercise of a Seder night? Because we want children to know that just like Hashem was involved in your great, great, great grandparents' lives, He's involved in your life. And even though you can't see him as revealed as they did, you need to know he's involved in your life. And we are intensely investing in that conversation Seder night. It's not about cute gematrias, it's not about cute divrei Torah, it's not about arts and crafts project, Haggadahs, all that's lovely and it's nice, but it's not what the night is about. The night is a question and answer. It's evoking the curiosity and the inquisitiveness of the children so that we can tell them. I gotta tell you, at our Shabbos table, Baruch Hashem, can I know how we have a lot of children, and it's hard to keep the children's attention. They want to leave the table, read a book, they disappear, they talk to one another, you lose them, especially if you have guests, especially if you have conversation. There's nothing that keeps the children's attention, at least at our Shabbos table, more than if my parents or in-laws are over and they're telling a story from their life, or of their parents, or of their grandparents, or their great-grandparents. All of a sudden, children's ears perk up. They want to hear, they want to learn, they want to listen. They're curious, it's so interesting. And it speaks to them, because these are their own ancestors. It's so meaningful. 
and it talks directly to them. So that's what Yitzhiya's Mitzrayim, that's what Sipur Yitzhiya's Mitzrayim is. We're telling our children a story about their own ancestors, but a story that directly, directly relates to their life. And why are we doing it? What's the purpose and mission? What's the goal of it? It's a curriculum. It's pedagogy. Why are we doing it? The Pasuk itself says, V'yedatem, ki ani Hashem. Tell, tell it why, V'yedatem. So there's an increased awareness and cognizance and knowledge that I'm God. You live in a world where you can sometimes forget I'm here. Let's tell a story that reminds everyone that he's here. Through the telling the story, a person arrives at knowing there's God. When we were in Egypt, we were indentured slaves. Not only were we physically in bondage, Paro didn't only assassinate, kill, murder, genocide, enslave, and persecute our people, but we were also assimilated into his value system, into his culture. We had abandoned our true selves, our true identity. So this is a very big theme, it's a Hasidic theme about Pesach, that what it means to be in Golos is that our Das is in Golos. Das means mindfulness, awareness, conscientiousness, presence, thoughtfulness. When you are enslaved, you don't have time to think. You don't have time to be. You don't have time to strategize. You don't have time to have intention. You're just overwhelmed. In fact, just today, the new Mishpacha magazine was published. I have an article in it on exactly this. The notion of that Golas is when our das, when our own capacity to think is in exile. And in the article, I talk all about what we can do to recover our das. Pesach is the experience. It's tragic that in the buildup and preparation for Pesach, Many people are not actually liberating themselves, they're further becoming enslaved. Right? With the overwhelming, um, unnecessary, again, I say that risking my own life, but the overwhelming, sometimes or often, or somewhat unnecessary amount of effort or work or time that's being invested, we have less margin, less room to think, less room to be, less room to, to prepare less room to liberate ourselves. It's the antithesis to what Pesach is supposed to be. So how do we recover Das? In the article I talk about the difference between being a thermostat and a thermometer. A, thermo- a thermometer tells you your temperature. A thermostat lets you control your temperature. When you have no Das, you, can, you know you're, th- you're a thermometer. You're talking to your friend and you say, I'm exhausted, I get no sleep, I have so many rooms yet to clean and I'm cooking and there's so many people are coming and I can't even think, I can't even breathe, I can't even be, I can't even sleep, I can't even... All you're doing is describing how miserable your life is. You're a thermometer, you're telling your temperature. And many people concede that they have the power to change it. And our mission, our goal is not just to be a thermometer, it's to be a thermostat. Change the temperature. Okay, okay, so be in control, be disciplined, be organized. Again, Shabbos HaGadol. So, Da'as and Golas, what does it mean to be in exile is the capacity to think to be as an exile. That's what Paro did. When he saw, when he was concerned, the Torah tells us, that when Paro was concerned that the Jewish people were plotting a rebellion, what did he do? He increased the work. Why did he increase the work? Because the more overwhelmed with work we are, the less room we have to think, to dream, to believe that it can be different. The first step to it being different is to believe it can be different. And the first step to believing it can be different is to have room to think. So whether it's your marriage, or whether it's your health, or whether it's your children, or whether it's your knowledge, or whether it's your career, or whatever it is that you want to be different, you have to believe it can be different. And the only way to arrive at being able to believe it can be different is to have the space and the room and the margin and the bandwidth to believe that it can be different. So the goal is that at the end of the night, when you've concluded Chad Gadja, and you've imbibed four cups of wine and countless pounds of matzah, and you feel disgusting. But the goal is to physically feel disgusting, but to spiritually feel alive and awake and to feel that you are, you've experienced revelation. When I sat down at the Seder, I was confused and I was uncertain and I had all kinds of doubts. But by the end of reviewing the story and hearing about my ancestors and seeing myself as going through that process and identifying in what ways have I been enslaved and how have I freed myself and where is God in my life, by the end of the night, instead of my das being in gullus, I have a yidiyah Hashem. I've made space, I've carved room, I have the bandwidth to feel and to see Hashem in my life. That's the purpose, the goal, the essence of Lamanta Saper. That's why we're going through this journey. It's not about the roast, 
it's important to have a good roast. But it's not about the china, the seder plate, the table. All that's beautiful. It, that all that's there to complement to enhance the the purpose of the night. You know, it's like you have a beautiful wedding, magnificent flowers and a gorgeous smorg and, and beautiful candelabra and amazing decor and beautiful wedding dress. But the chassan and kal don't really like each other. Well, what's the point of all that? What's the point of all that if you don't get to the essence, which is the love and the affection and the intimacy of the chassan and kala? So Seder night, the chassan and kala is us and Hashem. And we haven't had time to spend with each other. And we haven't been able to be intimate. And we've been uncertain what the future of our relationship with is. And then we come to the Seder night and all the decor is magnificent and everything is in place. But the purpose is to have yichud with Hashem, is to have das, is to stand under the chuppah with Hashem. The purpose is to know He's there and to have such a transformative experience that it leaves us changed the whole year. In another piece, I hope we're going to, you know, I chose this short piece and I'm like, this is a no-brainer, we'll get through this, no problem. We're going to get through it, we're going to get through it. But in another piece in Allah Yechva Alibov, he says something amazing, Rav Mishor. Manashtana halay lazeh, he says, Shamati me'echad lafare, sha'adam tzarech lisho asatmo, manashtana ayyidei halay lazeh. That manashtana is not about why is this night different than all of the nights, it's that how am I going to be different because of tonight? Manashtana, what's different after tonight? What's different? When Pesach is over, how am I a different person? How will I live with greater amuna bitachon dveikas? How will I be more patient, more kind, more loving? How will I make space and margin and room for others? How will I have a bandwidth to feel Hashem in my life? It's not manashtana halay lahazeh. It's manashtana al yidei halay lahazeh. What's different? Because of tonight. A whole different understanding of manashtana is so beautiful. Last week I was in Yerushalayim, Ir HaKodesh, and I went to a shir of one of my rebbeim, Rav Asher Weiss, the Minchas Asher Shlita. And in the shir... He described, he gave a great metaphor. He said, you know, when you have a phone, you can create favorites. You can create auto-dial, whatever they call it today. Why? So let's say I call you a 100 times a day, like Mea Brachos B'chol Yom, like to check in 100 times a day. So I could dial her number. It's made up of 10 digits, and that's time-consuming. Or I can take the time to put it in the phone once, and then just have to press one button, and now I call her. So... We all have spent the time to the people that we call the most often. It takes time. It takes effort. You've got to have their number there. And you've got to put it in. And you've got to save it the right way. Why do we do that? Because it makes much, much more efficient later that we can only press one button and we're able to contact that person. So said Rav Asher Weiss, Seder night is the night that we set aside to put all the amuna in the phone. The Because he was answering a question. We have a mitzvah every day of remembering that we left Egypt. So what's the difference between the mitzvah of Zechiros Yitzhiyah Mitzrayim and Sipur Yitzhiyah Mitzrayim? All year long we say Shema, the third paragraph, we remember that we left Egypt. What's the difference between the daily mitzvah to remember we left Egypt and Pesach night? It's like a super mitzvah. It's like the mitzvah on steroids. Uber mitzvah. So what's the difference between Pesach night and the mitzvah the whole year? Reb Chaim has a famous four differences. There's a lot of differences which are offered. But Vashar Weiss said, he said, all year long we do the speed dial way of remembering. On Pesach night, we're, we're recording the numbers. So we, we dwell on it. We take the time. We take our time. We do it slowly so that the rest of the year, very quickly, oh yeah, it's the time. I press one button and I'm drawing from the energy and the experience of what I spent that night. So the reservoir of Amuna that we're going to draw from the entire year is filled on Seder night, on Pesach night. That's our mission. That's our goal. That's what we're trying to accomplish. It, the, the Seder table is a place of great delicacies and great conversation and great people. But it's a classroom. Make no mistake. It's a laboratory and it's a classroom. And there's an educational message. There's a curriculum. There's a, there's a pedagogy to it. And the message is Hashem, that whatever confusion or lack of clarity or uncertainty or doubt we start the night with, we walk away feeling certain and confident. He was involved in their life. He's involved in my life. And I don't have to be anxious and I don't have to be jealous and I don't have to worry. I have to turn to him. I do my best. I take my initiative. And then I turn to him. I lean on him. So now says Rav Avim Shor, this is the Chiddush. This is where I'm about to take you in a different direction than you thought we were going to go. A person who wants to check, you want to see at the end of the Seder, in Be'emes, Mitzvah Sipur Yitzhiyas Mitzvah, Ma'isa Karoi, Boli De'a Amita, Za'i De'a Shabali De'a Mata Rav HaTachlis. So what's the exam? What's the final exam at the end of the night? If you want to know whether you achieved the goal, the mission, the purpose of the night, whether telling the story got you to the place of Yediyah, whether manashtana a yidei halay lahazeh. Ki ya'adam ha'shalim shabali de das, shi'ebam midas kono, tzarech lovali de midas hachna'a, 
v'savlanus la'anashim shelo yimitzratzel hem b'shar zmanim. It's fantastic. He says, if you want to know whether you completed the purpose of Seder night, the test is how you treat other people. The test is not about God. Whether you really have learned that there is a God and He runs things, the proof or the test, the metric or the measure is how you treat other people. Do you have patience? Do you have room in your heart? Do you have kindness? Because if you treat other people nicely, then you knew that telling the story was for a reason. Why? Why is all this? Because, you know, if you accept someone's your father, then it means their other children are your siblings. And you have a very different attitude to your siblings than you do to others. Sometimes for the good, sometimes for the bad. <laughs> you know, I, I once wrote another article about the idea that there, there are all kinds of people that we love even if we don't like. You know, your friends, you have to like because you've chosen them. But your family, even if you don't like them, you have to love them. Yes. You have to love people even if you don't like them. That's via have to lorecha kamocha is the mitzvah. You don't have to like them, but you have to love them. The difference between love and like, love is a verb. Like is an adjective. Love is how you treat other people. Like is how you feel about other people. You don't have to like your family members, but you have to love them. Love is about loyalty. Loyalty. To me, the number one thing about family is loyalty. You have each other's back. You don't stab each other in the back. You don't gossip about one another. You don't judge one another. You don't fail to give the benefit of the doubt to one another. Family is about loyalty. It's about loyalty. So love is a verb. It's showing loyalty. It's showing kindness. It's showing care to one another. So says Rav Avram Shor, if you want to know whether the Seder curriculum achieved its goal and you've learned the lesson, are you more patient? Are you more kind? Do you have room for others who until then you had no patience for? And why is that? Again, because if you love God and you realize He's running the world, so the person who used to drive you crazy, the person who used to think about things differently, the person who put a wrench in your plans, the person who... Now you realize Hashem runs the world. And if you love your father, you love his other children. Someone called me yesterday about an issue between their children. And I said, you know, maybe you can appeal to the one child to say that, look, I understand that you, you have this thing you can't get past with your sibling. I respect that. I accept that you were hurt by them. I understand that. But if you respond by doing what they want to respond by doing, understand you're not just hurting your sibling. Then now you're hurting me. And I didn't do anything to you. So I understand you're in pain and you deserve to figure out a way to work out that pain. And you should communicate and you should try to resolve it. But if you take this kind of revenge that what you want to do, you're not now just hurting your sibling. Now you're hurting me. And I didn't do anything to you. So Kodesh Baruch Hu looks down at us and he says, if you really believe in me, know that if you can't get along with my other children, you're not just hurting them. You're hurting me. The evidence of your belief in me is how you treat my other children. Don't claim to love me and not be kind to my other children. Not be kind to your siblings. So the proof, the evidence of whether we've learned the lesson of Seder night, whether we've discovered and accepted God, whether it's Manashtana Ayyadeh Lailazah, whether we are different because of this night, is have we grown to learn to love? The uh, Medrash, Tan de says that those who left Egypt had one mitzvah, one commandment. 613 had not yet been given, they had one mitzvah. And what was the one mitzvah? This one mitzvah was more beloved to God than all the other mitzvahs. The Medrash says, you know what their one mitzvah was? In whose merit they left Egypt? Just be nice to one another. Don't be a jerk. Don't be a... Just be nice. Just be nice. Ligmo chesed Be nice to one another. And that meant more to God than all the other mitzvahs. Be aguda achas. Be united. Be together. You know, we say this in our davening. In our Yasha we say, Nachisa bechastacha amzu ga'alta. Nachisa, how? Bechastacha, with chesed. And therefore, Amzu Ga'alta, you redeemed us. Who's Chesed? The simple understanding is, Nachisa B'chastacha means that Hashem, you did a great Chesed, a kindness with us by taking us out of Egypt. But the Vilna Gon famously explains it, Nachisa B'chastacha, and the Chavetz Chaim elaborates, doesn't mean your Chesed, Hashem. It means in the merit of people doing Chesed one another, God took us out. In the merit of people being kind to one another, God took us out. Have you ever been angry at your children? Someone misbehaved, but then you caught them getting along really nicely. And that, that wins you over. Now they can have whatever they want. 
Because all a parent wants really is for the children to love one another, to be loyal to one another, to get along with one another. Is there anything more, more joyous to a parent, more satisfying to a parent than to see their children getting along? So Gersh Baruch Hu says, look, you're saturated, you're marinated in the Mem Teshari Tumah. You have been marinating in the 49th level of Tumah. You have been pagans, idolaters. You've got it all wrong religiously. But you know what? Treat each other nicely. I'll take you out of here. Treat each other nicely. I'll take you on vacation. Treat each other nicely. I'll buy you that thing you want. Just treat each other nicely and you could win me over even if you have so much else wrong. You've got to get the other things right. It's not acceptable to get it wrong. But even while you yet have all the rest wrong, if you get along. So Nechisa Bechasta, the Chesed was what we showed with one another. He proves this to the Gon because the Pasuk says, Yishalu Ishme Yisrael Ehu. The Pasuk says when they left Egypt, they had to borrow something, Me Yisrael Ehu. So the simple understanding is they had to borrow something from the Egyptians and we took their gold and silver. And many years later, like uh, 20 years ago, some professor in Egypt tried to sue the Jewish people with interest for all that we stole. So, and the Gemara already tells this story. It's already recorded in the Gemara that their predecessor tried to do that. To which, what was our response? 210 years of slavery. Really, it was 86 years, whatever, a tenth slavery. But 210 years of slavery, if you figure out what we should have been paid an hour with inflation, you still are ahead <laughs> with whatever we took. But the villain Gaon reinterprets it, and he says the word Re'ehu means your friend, not your enemy. So when the Pasuk says you need to borrow something from Re'ehu, it wasn't talking about taking something from an Egyptian. It was talking about the Jews in Egypt with whatever little they had. God says, I need you to lend everything to one another. Exchange things, lend things, borrow from one another. Why? Because that was the only form of chesed that could be done yet in Egypt. And God says, in the merit of your doing chesed with one another is when I'm going to take you out. So when we do chesed, Kodesh Baruch redeems us. Why? Because when we love one another, when we love the people we don't like, it's easy to love the people you like. It's easy. But when you love even the people you don't like, then the father says, wow, my kids get along. My kids love one another. I'll do anything for them. And that's what the evening is about. We discover Hashem and we make Him our father so that we realize that everyone else are our siblings. Our fellow Jews are our siblings. So therefore the proof of our amuna is our avas Yisrael. If you have no avas Yisrael, you have no amuna. You can't claim to love God and be cruel and unkind to his other children. If you love God, you're nice to his children. And if you're not nice to his children, then you don't really love God. It's just that simple. Because of Arab Balatanya in Siddur, when a person is overjoyed, when a person is happy, then they can tolerate even their enemy, even people they don't like. There's nothing can... When you've got a skip in your step and, and a bounce in your step... And when you're joyous and happy and singing and everything feels right, nobody could bring you down. So the point at the end of the night is to be so besimcha. We sing, we're going to mention on Shabbos, one of the reasons given the Simani Haseder, why we begin, Kadesh Orchatz, Karpas Yachatz. We begin with song. We're about to lift everybody up. Let's sing a song. Everybody knows Kadesh Orchatz. Let's sing a song. Because when you're overjoyed, when it's Kishmak, when you're singing, when you've got to skip in your step, nobody could bring you down. Nobody could bring you down. And this is why we drink the four cups of wine. Because wine makes you happy. It takes away your inhibition. It takes off the edge. It makes you happy. It makes you glad. It makes you giggle. It makes you laugh. The other thing wine does is it reveals our essence. So you know who we are in our core? In our core, we love everyone. In our core, we're kind. In our essence, internal, inside, at our core, we have Avas Yisrael. So, we help realize our essence, who we are. We take away the inhibitions. Why don't I like that person? Because it's not cool to like that person. And why don't I tolerate that person? Because what would they think of me if I tolerate that person? And when you drink a little wine, you take away the inhibitions. And you don't care what anyone else thinks. And you allow your inner goodness to shine and to break through. That makes room for everyone. That makes room for everyone. The purpose of drinking on Pesach and the four cups is to take off the edge, to remove our inhibitions, to gladden our heart, to lift us with song, and to make room for us to be able to love everyone, even the people we don't like. And the four cups, four cups is the measure to get a shtickle inebriated. Just look at most of you at the end of your Seder. <laughs> so what happens when you get a little inebriated? This is the essence of Purim. But, you know, when you're a little bit inebriated, you realize that I, I don't understand anything going on. I have no comprehension. I have no clarity. You forfeit your das. 
So just like you forfeit your das by having four cups of wine, you realize I forfeit my das, das kono, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the one in charge. So when you realize, I don't have to be in charge, I don't have, it doesn't have to be my way, not everyone has to think like me, look like me, I forfeit my almost autonomy, I forfeit my ego. When I stop edging God out and I make room for God, you know who else I make room for? Everyone else. Everyone else. When I have an ego, I've not only edged God out, with God I've edged everyone else out. But when I can sublimate my ego, when I can submit my ego, when I can um, constrict, consolidate, constrict my ego, and I've now made room for God, I've also made room for others. Poschen, and that's why, now the next word. Poschen hagada bepiska halach ma'anya. How do we begin the Haggadah? With this Aramaic, disingenuous invitation. We say, Whoever's hungry, come and eat. Whoever needs, come off of the carbon Pesach. Um, Umakshina Olam in the whole world asks, is there a more disingenuous invitation than sitting with your windows closed, your doors closed, nobody can hear you, and you say, as a grace at Tzaddik, anyone who's hungry, please, we're, we're a very welcoming home, we're a very open home, anybody who needs. Let's see you stand up at the end of the shul and say that. Let's see you send out a broadcast email or post on your social media, anyone who needs a meal. You're such a big uh, Grace of Kanaker because the door is closed, hermetically sealed, the window is closed, hermetically sealed, and you're proclaiming anyone who needs come and eat? What's the purpose of this invitation? So you're not really, you're not extending the invitation for others. We should extend the invitation for others long before Pesach. Now is the time. Now is the time. We're 10 days out. Think of somebody who maybe has not been invited for a meal, who might be alone, who needs an invitation. And by the way, the most meaningful person to invite is not the person you like. Mm-hmm. It's the person that you love even though you don't like. Uh-huh. And you're able to restore that achtas for Kla Yisrael. But we're not really inviting people, so what are we doing? Says Rav Avram Shor, you know why we start out? We sit down at the Seder and the first thing we do is we say... Anyone who needs, come and eat. It's not a genuine invitation. We acknowledge that. Why am I saying that? What I'm saying is, you know what? I know that right now no one's coming to this meal because of this invitation. But I want to be on record that as of tonight, kol dichvin, even the people I don't like, I love. I'm going to start inviting people for meals even when I don't agree with them or get along with them or we're not particularly friendly, they're a stranger. That's who I'm going to have. The invitation is not for others. The invitation is an affirmation of our own. It's an affirmation that I don't need to lock in to only invite my closest friends or the people who are exactly like me or who conform to my view of the world. I'm going to invite people who I love but don't like. You know that um, the first night of the Seder is the same day of the week that Tisha B'Av falls. If you want to know when Tisha B'Av will be the summer, all you have to know is when... So, Seder is Friday night. Is it Seder Friday night? Yes. Seder is Friday night. So Tisha B'Av is going to be Friday night. We're going to observe it Saturday night, Sunday. Every year, if you want to know when Tisha B'Av will be, look at what's the connection of Tisha B'Av and Pesach. We spoke about this a little bit yesterday in the Parsha class. Why we eat the egg at the Seder table and we wear the kittel and all the allusions to mourning are because, you know, Pesach, even though we spend one night and we feel like royalty and regal and we're celebrating with glory and coronating God and the divine protection he provides, the reality is we're still in Gullus and there's still anti-Semitism and there's still dangers and there are still threats. And the reality is that we're still living a Tisha B'Av existence. And why do we have Tisha B'Av? Why do we sit low to the ground? And why was the Beis HaMikdash destroyed? Why? Sin is Couldn't get along. Yosef and his brothers couldn't figure it out. They couldn't even say hello. They couldn't give a Shalom Aleichem. They couldn't be in the same room. You voted for who? You think what? You root for what team? You wear what yarmulke? You send your kid to which school? If you don't conform and do exactly as I want and I believe and I see for myself, I have no room, I have no space for you. And what's the result of that? It's churban. It's devastation and destruction. God says, it makes sense by the way, a parent is sitting there and their children are saying, you know, and, and this happens sadly, children don't vote for the same candidate. Children don't send to the same school. They don't wear the same yarmulke and they don't listen to the same music and they don't wear the same clothing and they don't choose the same hashka for a lifestyle. So when a parent sits there and overhears children judging and marginalizing and dismissing and rejecting one another, you know what the parent says? Bye-bye, I'm going home. I don't want to be here. I don't need to be here. I don't want to be here. And I'm certainly not taking you all away for Pesach or taking you away on vacation or giving you all gifts or showering you with blessing. If you guys can't get along, I'm out of here. 
Choose what you choose for yourself. You don't have to judge others. So the Rebbe Shalom says the same thing. And that's what the Churban Beis Mikdash was. That's what Tisha B'av was. Hashem is watching. He's sitting there. And he's like, I shower you with blessing. I give you everything. And all you do is criticize and judge and dismiss one another. I'm out of here. I'm leave- the Beis Mikdash was our home. And he says, I'm leaving the home. I'm out of here. I'm gone. I'm going to a retirement community where you young people can't go. Because I don't want to be around you if you can't get along. So how do we, what should the children do in that moment? Chase after the parent and say, no, 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 you're right, we love one another, we're not going to bring up the things, we're only going to focus on what brings us together, or we're going to learn to disagree agreeably, we're going to love one another, we're going to like one another, we're going to be loyal to one another. Please, you have to come back. Pesach is our chasing Hashem and saying, please, you have to come back. It's our night of achtas. We, it's our night of das, emunah. We know you're here, we believe in you, you're our father, and we're chasing after you, you have to come home. It's the same night as Tisha B'av because Pesach is the antidote, it's the repair to Tisha B'av. Tisha B'av was the damage, was the sinas chinam. It's what, how did we get to Egypt to begin with? Pesach celebrates our leaving Egypt. Well, how did we get to Egypt? Sinas chinam. They sold Yosef into slavery, which is, I mentioned yesterday again, the Rabbeinu Manoach and the Rambam. Why do we eat karpas at the Seder table? The word karpas comes from Ketonas Pasim, the colored coat of Yosef. And what did they do with the coat of Yosef? When they sold him into slavery and they went to the father, what did they tell Yaakov? Where was Yosef? What happened to his coat? They dipped his coat in blood. So we take karpas and we dip it in salt water and we begin our Seder by remembering how it all began. Before we can talk about leaving Egypt, we've got to remember how we got to Egypt. And the way we got to Egypt was sinas chinam. And the way we'll leave Egypt is avas chinam, is avas Yisrael. And that's why at the Seder, kol dichven yesev yechol, we make this affirmation, this proclamation, our home, our Shabbos table, it's open to anyone. I don't care what you look like, what you believe, who you are, how you live, how you dress. Our, our Shabbos table is open to any Jew. I love all Jews. Because I dip the karpas and I invite anyone who wants to come and I remember that if Sinas Chinam got me into Egypt and I want to leave Egypt, the only thing that's going to help me leave Egypt is Avas Chinam. That's what the night is all about. So it appears the same night as Tisha B'Av. How did Tisha B'av happen? The Gemara tells us in Gittin. The famous story of Tisha B'av was the story of Kamtza and Bar Kamtza. You remember the story of Kamtza and Bar Kamtza? Yeah. Yeah. Where a wealthy man had a banquet, had an amazing event. And he didn't invite the whole community. He didn't invite the whole shul. He only invited his friends. And he made a mistake on the invitation. Kamtza, Bar Kamtza, and the wrong person came. It was his enemy who came. And when the... He said, realized his enemy was there. He said, you have to leave. And the enemy said, look, for me to leave now, it's embarrassing, it's humiliating. Everybody, this is the event of the year. I'll pay for my own way. And the host said, no, you're my enemy. I don't, even if you pay for your own way, you're out of here. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll pay for everyone. I'll pay for the whole event. I'll tell you, you could come to my weddings anytime <laughs> if they make that offer. He said, I'll pay for your whole event. Just let me stay. It's humiliating. And the host said, no, you're my enemy. I don't care what you offer in the world. You're out of here. And he sent them away. And as a result, this individual led to certain actions that ultimately brought about the destruction of the Jewish people, the destruction of the Churban. How did it all begin? With baseless hatred. So, says Rav Avram Shor, how did Tisha B'av come about because of a lack of an invitation, a disinvitation, a rejection of a person? So how do we repair? We sit down at a Seder table and we invoke Tisha B'av at the Seder by saying, if Kamtsa and Bar Kamtsa is what launched the whole thing, Tisha B'av, then our table is open and welcome and inviting to anyone and everything, wherever you are politically, religiously, and so on. How does that paragraph end? We say, Whoever's hungry, come and eat. We love even those we don't like. Everyone has room at my table. And only once we extend that invitation, how do we end the paragraph? Right now we're here in Boca Raton. Right now we're here, where do people go all over the world these days? I'm in uh, Greece. Right now I'm in Carmia. Right now I'm in, I don't know where people go, Moscow. Um, right now I'm, um, but Lashana Haba next year, because I've invited anyone, and I'm doing Avas Chinam, and I'm repairing the damage of Churban and Tisha B'av, therefore, Lashana Haba Ba'ara Yisrael. That's going to bring the Geula next year, we're going to be in Israel. So like I said, it's a very redirection. We talk about Pesach as the Chag Ha'amunah as a very religious experience. You have to walk away. You're on fire with Hashem. You feel His presence. You defer to Him. You submit to Him. You love Him. You cling to Him. And all that's very, very, very true. 
But comes Rav Avram Shur and says, you know where the proof is? Whether you've achieved all that? Are you more patient? Are you more kind? Do you make space for people that you like? Have you learned to love even those you don't like? Are you part of one family? Because if you want Hashem to come back to the house, then you need to have achtos. It was the mitzvah that got us out of Mitzrayim, chesed, and it's the mitzvah that will bring us the gula in the future. Can we live with unity? Can we connect? We prove our faith and our love for Hashem by the way we treat His other children. And so I pray and I hope that when we sing Manashtana, we'll be able to answer, not Manashtana halay lazeh, Manashtana ayyadeh lay lazeh, what has changed. And hopefully what will change will be not only an increased faith in Hashem, but an increased love of our fellow Jew, which will bring the Geula b'mehir v'yamin, v'chad kasher v'sameach.